Good day, Flight. It's Can-Am Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And our ex executive producer, Huck, is in the room. Huck, hey, want to shake hands? Want to shake? Come on. Oh, that's a good girl. Yeah, it's a pretty girl. Yeah, sir. She likes the top of her head scratched and the bottom of her chin scratched. Oh, yeah, it's so pretty. Yeah, yeah, she's a good girl. Yeah, she came in to uh, monitor the situation and make sure that we're doing our job. Glad to see she's here. And we're gonna go right back to doing what we do best, and that is talking about missing people. And that's what this segment is about, missing people. And then we're gonna talk about some uh, some interesting news on the side that uh, deals with missing people and deals with orbs and UFOs and all the thing that goes along with it. Now one of the things that uh, that was fascinating to me and many people have heard of this man and I'm going to talk about him briefly is uh, Travis Walton. Travis and I first met probably eight or nine years ago at a conference together and uh, immediately he wanted to talk. He knew my work. I think we were friends right away. One thing about Travis is that I never got a feeling he was lying about anything he, he said. Well, I saw a show last night. <laughs> it was in the middle of the night. It was, it was late and I, I was getting in bed and I turned it on and I couldn't go to sleep and I forgot. I don't even remember what show it was, but it was about his event. He interviewed his wife, his brother, who he called right after the event, a couple of little loggers who were there that took polygraphs. It was impressive. And the story about Travis, just so you know, is he was with a group of loggers coming out of the mountains in Arizona. They see this bright light in the forest. They stop. Travis was one of the first guys out of the truck. He's the guy who walked the closest to this UFO, and he got too close to it, and he disappeared. He disappeared for five days, and then he wakes up on a road in the middle of nowhere, outside of a city that he recognized, and he made it down to the city, called his brother, his brother picked him up, went through a reverse hypnosis. The story matches much of what I've talked about right here, missing 411, the UFO connection. They were in the woods when Travis disappeared. It's a very compelling story. And uh, Travis was involved in a documentary movie about his event called Fire in the Sky. And if you can watch it, do it. Uh, he and I have had a lot of talks about it. And in fact, one of the, a couple years ago, I was in uh, Phoenix talking and he brought his son to my presentation. And he told me, yeah, Dave, my son's a big fan of yours. And uh, I was, I was humbled. And uh, we had a good conversation. But uh, Travis is a good man. Something very strange happened to that guy. Very strange. So let's get into uh, some of the letters. Hey, Dave, I'm watching your latest YouTube video in which you shared some photo of a triangular shaped craft that looks like it's in kind of a stealth cloud mode. About 10 years ago, I was working for the Hopewell News in central Virginia. I noticed a highly unusual aerial formation on the way to work during a partly cloudy sunny day. I took a few photos. To me, the images I'm sharing with you suggest some kind of stealth hidden cylindrical huge object in the sky. This visually hidden object, however, is displacing a cloud layer, which reveals its position. I pulled into a church parking lot, aimed my camera to the south-southwest. This was in the winter. It was morning, noonish, or early afternoon. Again, I took these photos myself and would easily sign an affidavit about its authenticity. So, could this be some strange natural cloud formation and or atmospheric interaction? Possibly. My personal assessment is that this is a stealth concealed object or craft hidden in some way above Hopewell, Virginia, and it was revealed for a time by the clouds dispersing around it. Just something for you to add to your accumulation of research, facts, and formation. Thought you'd enjoy this. 
So the man who sent this to me is a friend. I've known him for a long time. And he's a reporter and uh, highly credible. This is the photo that he sent me. So if you can see in here, and you can see it, I think, very easily, here's the outline of this object in the sky that's dispersing the clouds around it. And you can't see it. What would be pretty cool is if you're looking through this with FLIR or you were looking at it through night vision. Now, on the, in a daytime setting, you can't look through night vision. So FLIR would have maybe shown a heat signature here that you can't see. Definitely something weird. I don't think it's natural in my humble opinion. But thanks for sending that in. Every once in a while, I'll get a photo and I'll share it with you. Hey, Dave, I can't say enough great things about you and your work. You're a unique individual, especially for YouTube, where it's a pain in the rear to weed through all the BS. Dave, we could say that death is the final, ultimate portal. We have no way of knowing what happens, but we don't know what happens with any other portal and what or who are those who don't return. Are they assumed deceased? Anyhow, it's made me think. I want to share a story. <clears throat> I know we don't discuss near-death experiences, but if I see it as a portal, may it fit. My husband John is 73. He had a second heart attack four months after the first, and when they placed a stent in his artery. So he was in a fragile state when the ambulance took him to the hospital this time. It was determined early on that another artery was blocked and he needed that opened and another stent placed in the stabilizer by him time to consider options for further treatment. It wasn't until several weeks later that he told me what happened. As people clambered around trying to save his life, he felt himself drift off into a peaceful sleep. The voices shouting orders diminishing until he no longer heard anything. Those are the voices of the physicians and things around him. Then John heard the clickety-clack, clickety-clack of a train and felt his body gently sway as the train made its way felt relaxed, very peaceful. From a foggy distance, faces started coming into view. A woman he didn't know, dressed in a long white nightgown. Then his grandmother, who he had seen but knew instantly. She had gray hair and clothing from the Victorian era, as did other men and women who slowly came forth. John knew they were all waiting for him and, and looked happy. The clickety-clacks slowed as the train approached the station. The distant fog was changing into beaming sunlight under a blue sky. John felt peace. Nothing hurt. Everything was great. He could hardly wait for it to end so he could get off and greet these smiling people. And then boom, times four, it was very abrupt. John experienced intense pain from head to toe. A nurse was sitting on him, pressing so hard on his chest that he thought his ribs were breaking. Someone yelled out to clear so he could shock John with the paddles. Just then the nurse who'd been on top of him hollered out, he's back with us. The cheer went out in the operating room and someone quickly administered some morphine. John was dazed, confused, and in a world of pain. He remained in the hospital and, and the plan was to have a quadruple bypass as soon as possible, which he did after a few days. John celebrated his 73rd birthday in February. He's frequently out of breath, tires easily, and takes a basket full of medications to keep him alive. But he enjoys life to the fullest. Ever grateful that we live near Boston in some of the world's best hospitals. If John isn't home, he's out on The Chief, a 2000 anniversary production of the Indian Motor Works classic. She's a beauty, too. Black and cream, soft tail, and well-loved. Thanks for reading my letter, Dave. I know how busy you are. Maybe you could take a snow day and just catch up on emails. Ha ha. What do you think about death as a portal? What do you think lies beyond the door we all pass through? Love to you, Angie and Huck and the villagers. It's an interesting way to view death. And if you believe we have a soul, then there's a lot of similarities between the portal escape and the death of a person. A lot of similarities. Now, some of some of my religious or highly religious viewers may get mad at me for even bringing up those similarities, but 
I'm a fact person and the facts are there's a lot of similarities. Hey Dave, as a father myself, my heart goes out to you and your loved ones about Ben. I've become a dedicated fan of Missing 411. I watched 411 UFO last night and finished the doc this evening. You and your team did a very nice job keeping me engaged in the show. Very odd, strange, weird, and unbelievable. My question to you, that's the movie, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. Do any women go missing in the areas you showcase in Missing 411 documentaries? Absolutely. They do. They do. Next letter. Hey Dave, my partner and I are big followers of you and Steve. We love listening to both. I live in Powell River, British Columbia and heard your story the other day about a man going missing near Suicide Creek. It was just the other day I did that story. Kind of crazy to think of when I used to walk those trails alone with just my dog. The picture is one of the entrances to Suicide Creek. It's near Duck and Haslam Lakes. The second picture is of what we believe is a female Sasquatch. We saw three of them that day. Two walking up a hillside, and this one squatting in the trees up on the hillside, probably about 30 miles away from us. We were driving on the logging road about 35 miles up near the Eldred Valley. Never had any negative feelings or anything. We were just in awe. Like, did we just see that for real? Suicide Creek and Duck Lake only a 10 minute drive from my house. The Eldred Valley is about an hour and a half drive from the home. We have such beautiful backcountry here, never ending lakes and trails. We're also home to the Sunshine Coast Trail, which goes from Sarah Point, Desolation Sound, all the way to Saltberry Bay. 180 kilometer hiking experience. If you're ever out this way, I'd be more than happy to show you around. Thanks for all you do. Now, say what you want about the picture, but very few Bigfoot pictures I say are real. I say this is real. And if you look at it very carefully, it almost looks like there is a breast right there. Right? Right there, there's a protrusion. And people say, well, why can't these get more clear. Why, why can't we find a nice, clear picture of a Bigfoot? There's something about Bigfoot and that aura about them. Maybe there's some type of electrical interference that runs with them, as runs with UFOs. I don't know. But when you're looking through a massive amount of foliage to try to pick out something very small 100 yards away, it's very difficult to get that one item in focus while everything else is not. Very hard. Thanks for the picture. And that area of British Columbia I've been in many times. I've had many strange occurrences. And uh, high in Bigfoot activity, very high. Hey Dave, when I was 74, 75 years old, a small blue orb appeared in my bedroom one night. It was in the late fall or early winter of 16 or 17. I can't recall the exact year, but I was living in Las Vegas. It happened in the early morning hours, but I can't recall what time. It's strange that my memory is so foggy and when this happened, ordinarily I gave it great memory. I feel like a fool. I woke from sleep for no reason and saw it clearly on the ceiling near my bed. It was a small sphere the size of a marble, but well-defined edges. It was bright, translucent, turquoise to robin egg blue color which was close to the blue color of the numbers display in my electric alarm clock. No bedroom lamp was on, but a good deal of light from outdoor security flood lamps was shining through the double windows along one wall. And the nightlight was on in the bathroom. So the area was not really dark. The orb was situated in the center of a translucent pale blue sky veil thing that glowed softly and steadily. The veil thing was hanging down from the s against the ceiling. It spread out into a round shape with gentle folds like a cloth curtain. It bulged outward from its center and curved back upward to touch the ceiling along the edges. It looked like it was upside down, poofy, soft cloth with a tiny orb in the center. We all woke up together. My cat looked up but didn't react. She had been asleep next to me. My Roddy looked up from his spot on the floor next to the bed, but he didn't react either. 
the cat and dog never moved from their spots. There was no noise, no movement for a few seconds. Then the veil thing and the orb disappeared. I got out of bed and walked a couple steps and the orb reappeared a couple of feet in front of me. At the level of my chest, I stood still. My mind told me to stand still and watch. I didn't feel threatened or scared, just curious. I did not take a cell phone photo. The orb slowly floated away from me, went through the open closet door, I didn't move. It then emerged from the other open closet door. It's a long closet. It definitely knew how to navigate the bedroom and the bathroom. It then disappeared in front of a chest and stood out against the wall. There was no smell, no noise, no color change, no trace of an air current to move it. It slowly and purposely stayed at the same level in the room. The entire incident lasted a minute or two. I wasn't upset by this event, and afterward as I went back to bed and fell asleep quickly. However, a few months later, another odd thing happened, and I feel there might be a connection. It was around midnight, summertime. I was sitting in a chair watching TV in my bedroom. On the second floor, suddenly a very bright light was visible through the bedroom windows. I went over and looked out. The light was odd. It was shining down directly onto our swimming pool, which is located next to the house, directly under the bedroom windows. The light was intense, clearer to white golden in color, with gold-colored bright sprinkles floating inside. I tried to see the source looking upwards, but couldn't see anything except the light itself. The light was focused only on a portion of our pool. Beyond, I could see our backyard wall and the neighbor's backyard clearly in the moonlight and security floodlights. I did not want to go downstairs or out the doors to look at it. I was curious, but felt it was best just to stay back in the chair and watch it out the windows. After several minutes, the light retreated upward. Yes, the light moved upward. There was no noise, no vibrations, nothing. This was not a metro helicopter searchlight. It was totally weird. It took several days for me to get it into the pool again. Sorry this account's so long, but I wanted it to be as descriptive as and inclusive as possible. Hope I've provided something useful. The thing I've said is true, and nothing I've been exaggerated. It's the honest truth. I've avoided talking about either incident, afraid of sounding like a loony. However, last year I sent you an email about the blue orb, but forgot to include the location, so I figured you might have deleted it as a result, so I'm resending. I read all your books except the last one and watched all your DVDs many times. I admire your dedication and hard work and all your research. You do a great amount of good for us. I'm currently reading three of John D'Souza's books. Thank you for introducing him to us. Dave, you're in my Jewish prayers, and I share your grief for the loss of your beloved son, Ben. Thank you. Okay, now off the letters for a second. This is really important. There's some idiot. I don't use bad language often, but this person is an idiot. And I'm very mad because he's trying to take advantage of our villagers. He posts things using a logo that somewhat looks like the Can-Am Missing Project logo. And then he'll say, oh, send me a direct message right away on WhatsApp. Now, there's two of them doing it. And both the messages look like this. And the logos look like that. So first of all, I don't have WhatsApp. I'm not going to ever post anything and say for you to contact me on a different site. I'm going to, if I ever say anything, it'll say, send me an email at my email address. But those are the key ones right there. If you see this, ignore them. Don't click on them. Don't be involved with them. This person is an idiot. One of them is real Nick Johnson. I'm sure that's a lie. And another one is pinned by can Missing Project. And that's a lie too. So ignore those. I don't want you to become a victim. And this is about the sixth time I've said this in a video. So, uh, I mean, you can respond to him and tell him he's an idiot. That's fine. <laughs> but don't click on their link. All right. And by the way, I've sent at least 10 messages to YouTube. They won't do anything. Frustrating. They don't care. Next letter. Hey, Dave, enjoy your channel, especially the factual news. I've been wanting to send you an email for a long time regarding my son Isaac and to tell you a strange story about what looked like a ghost. Not sure what it was. To start, I almost lost Isaac to suicide a few years ago. 
Joined the Air Force in 2016 and was discharged two years later for PTSD. He was in and out of VA hospitals and all the VA could do was medicate him. He was on so many pills I couldn't keep up with all of them. For three years I took care of him and watched him go from robust 18 year old to become a frail old man in his 20s. I found out years after he was discharged what caused the PTSD. He saw some things that he just couldn't come to grips with. Horrific things that were classified and almost destroyed him. Isaac bore no physical scars but there was a war going on inside of his head. If you don't think mental illness is real, just talk to someone who lives with it who has lost someone to it. Exactly. Exactly. I was at my wit's end. I was right there with him every day making sure that he had food, that he would eat because he would forget to eat, clothes to wear. Also did a lot of praying. He would sleep most of the time but the drugs kept him like a zombie. I would always invite him to church but he never would go. One day I asked him to go with me and he said yes. Dave, that day changed his life. He accepted God into his life. He became a different man. The next few weeks he stopped taking all the drugs he had been prescribed. The withdrawals from the drugs were hell. He sweated. He shook violently. He even shuddered for two weeks. Neither he nor I got very much sleep during that time, but he came through it. One day I started looking at his medical records from all of his stays at the hospitals. There were thousands of pages, diagnosis, tests, conversations with therapists, psychiatrists. Of all the things that I read, the one thing that shook me to the core was a conversation that he had with a therapist. He told her that one day he felt like he couldn't go on. And he took a pistol and put it in his head and was about to pull the trigger. And he heard me pull into the driveway. If anyone doesn't think just being in someone's life can't make a difference, they're wrong. If I hadn't pulled up into that driveway to check on him, I would have found him dead later. He has never told me about this, and I don't know if he knows. I've read it. Isaac has gotten through all the bad days and turned his life around. He's married and I believe has a great life and future. Now to the ghostly woman. I live a few miles from a town in Alabama called Gadsden. It's a small old town that hasn't changed much in the last century. We have a big car show there once a month. I was leaving one of the, those shows about four years ago. My youngest son and my wife were with me. It was a summer night. The windows were down. We were enjoying this warm southern night air. I was going down a side street heading home and I saw a woman about 20 to 30 feet ahead of me. What caught my eye was that she was a small frame woman with an almost translucent look. She was young and wearing what looked like dirty shredded wedding dress. Her skin looked grayish. She was dark eyes. The strangest thing was that I could hear her walk. I know that sounds crazy, but I could hear what sounded to me like a tambourine with every step. She never looked at me, but I was captivated by her. I just stopped the truck and stared. Then I said to my wife and son, look at that woman. But they said, what woman? I said, that woman, you don't see her? She's right in front of us. I was the only one that could see the woman. I stared at her, I stared at her for about a minute and watched her walk down the street. I then turned left to head towards home. When I looked in the mirror, she wasn't there. I never forgot that. I don't know what I saw or why I saw it, but I do know what I saw. Thanks for all you do. I love your common sense, Dave. Thank you. Story about Isaac. Whew. Hard stories to tell. Everybody needs somebody in their life, close to them, keep tabs on them, to drive into their driveway at times, unannounced. We all need those friends. I was in San Jose last week over some work. I really don't like going to California at all anymore. And one of the nights I got together with a group of friends, friends I've known since junior high school. And all of them are retired policemen. And there's so much about our past that pulls us together. And everybody knows about Ben. We talked about him a little bit, not a lot. 
And I could tell that they're still uncomfortable about it. They don't know what to say. And they're afraid to say something wrong. Let me say this. If you know someone who has lost a child, they generally want to talk about it with someone who's close to them. You really can't say anything wrong because you wouldn't. You're a good person. If you say something that causes them to be emotional, it's not that you said anything wrong. And they wouldn't hold you accountable for that. I'm glad I got together with those friends. I love them like brothers. And I'm lucky they're in my life. But everybody with mental health issues needs somebody like that. Next letter. Hey Dave, I hope all's well on keeping to the facts. Your uptick in YouTube content is very appreciated. That's a fact. I've been with you since the GoFundMe days. Your evolution and presence gives me solace day to day and on my journey to understand and explain what I see. I posted this the other day and it made me think of you. It's a vital point in the pushback of bad ideas. Perhaps the long-standing idea that people looking at the facts and formulating some idea on how things worked or occurred in a little conceptual package called a working theory will stop being called a conspiracy. These folks need to go back and watch some of the old black and white detective shows. Working theory, folks, no conspiracy. Conspiracy is a gathering of people working to do something nefarious and keep it hidden from those it will affect, as well as those that can hold them accountable for their nefarious actions. It's the simple facts that reveal intention, and your detective spidey sense tells you what others cannot even imagine. We do not have to define evil, it defines itself by its words, silence, actions, and inactions, and the timing of all four things. So happy you have a good dog and a great wife. All the best. So I've talked about this before. I'll probably talk about it again many times. But I would say it's 98 to 2 positive comments to negative that I get. But friends, it's, it's amazing to me how vulgar and demeaning people can be. So you've seen a lot of posts from me over the years. You've been in a lot of videos. I don't call a lot of people names because I think I have a better grasp of the English language that I can get my point across without using swear words, without calling people demeaning names. Now, the description I may lay on them may seem to be demeaning, but it'll probably be all factual. Now, what do I think about some of these people? If you have to get on the internet and you have to call somebody a name or swear at them and you don't even know them, what does that say about yourself? Now I know, after doing 400 plus videos, each averaging 45, 50 minutes in length, there's a lot of hours out there that you could probably think you know me pretty well. My Angie would say, oh, you don't know Dave. <laughs> so, but you probably do know me fairly well. Pretty calm, takes a lot to get me riled up. I don't have tantrums. Now, people doing things to harm this country, that gets me riled up. But we're on a missing persons video, so I don't want to wander off there right now. Suffice it to say, if you're at that point in life that you're so mad at somebody and you just feel like blowing up, 
Take a deep breath. Turn around and come back to talk another day. Because when you think about it, there's going to be a better way to say what you were going to say. Let's stop there. And let's get into missing people. All of these cases are brand new. New in our research. You're not going to see them anywhere on the internet until you see them here, and then they'll be all over the internet. First case involves a woman named Anne Bragg, 76 years old. Show you a picture of Anne. This is Anne. 76 years old, missing December 2nd, 1951 at 9 a.m. This is on Double Oak Mountain in Alabama. Now, Anne had eight children, four grand grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. So early in the morning on December 2nd, she went to visit her daughter, J.P. Jones, on the mountain. She stayed till about 9 o'clock in the morning, and then the family knew that she was going to leave and walk 500 yards through the mountains to visit her son, Ernest. And Ernest and his wife just had a new grandson, and she was invited over to see the grandson and spend the day and have dinner. Now, Anne grew up on this mountain. She had done this trip hundreds of times. She knew where all of her family lived. She could probably walk it with her eyes closed. Well, she left at 9 a.m. She didn't arrive. Son started to call the sheriff. And the Shelby County Sheriff, A.E. Norwood, took control. Now, where is this? So the mountain's located right here. And this is Birmingham, Alabama over here. This is still a very, very rural place. Now, there's tons of lakes, ponds, rivers in this area where she disappeared. And the path that she took followed a small creek through this ravine. So by noon, the sheriff was on scene and he was already gathering resources. This trail, it was described as meandering next to the creek. The sheriff got 200 Boy Scouts there by 2 p.m. And he also had a civil air patrol plane that was flying in the skies that day. And by 4 p.m. that day, it started to rain. And the rain got heavier during the night. Search went on for two days and wasn't finding anything. And then a fortune teller contacted the sheriff. And this fortune teller described in great detail where she'd be found. And she was supposedly to be found in this search area. Well, the sheriff listened to it, drew a map with her help, and handed it to searchers in the field. And their statement was that map was identical to the location where she went missing. So if she's still in this area, we should find her. So the search went on. There were 350 searchers by the, sec by the third day, rather. 350. That's a lot for 1951 Alabama. Mrs. Bragg was described by her kids as extremely fit. She could walk easily through those mountains. She'd done it her whole life. Occasionally, she would have short-term memory loss, but they said that that never affected her movement through the valley because it was something she did her whole life. It's like knowing your backyard. So nobody thought she wandered away. In fact, one of the reporters stated in an article after a week and a half, it's like she was snatched off the earth. A local minister asked for divine intervention to find her. Two week search, nothing. Now, this happened on December 2nd, 51. Go, go forward eight and a half years. July 6th, 1959, a man named S.G. Bragg, who was a nephew of Ann Bragg, who also lived in that Birmingham area, was driving his truck uh, from his residence 
to go hunting and disappeared. It was never found. Never found. And even the article in 1959 described Anne's disappearance and said that it was one of the true mysteries in Alabama's history. So what happened to Anne Bragg? You would think after all of these years that someone would have come across her clothing, her shoes, her boots, her property of where she disappeared. But no, that's never happened. All I can say is very odd. She went missing next to a creek. Never any tracks were found. It rained the night she disappeared. It rained harder the next day. Very odd. Very odd. But you want to talk about odd. This next story is even more odd. A Norwegian man, Lars Feld, F-J-E-L-D, 89 years old, missing October 19, 1945, and he was Norwegian. He lived alone in a rural cabin in Clayton, Washington. Now, where's Clayton? Well, this is Clayton. This is Loon Lake. He lived a, less than a half a mile away from Loon Lake. This is Spokane. If you followed me and you've read Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence, one of the most unusual disappearances in, I've ever written about occurred right there. This is the Idaho border. Washington has many unusual disappearances, as does Idaho, as does Montana, as does British Columbia just to the north. And I constantly sit and ask myself, what is it about those four areas? What is it? Well, Lars lived alone in this rural cabin. And he had a real good friend named Ralph Crick. He was the low, closest neighbor about a mile away. Well, Ralph hadn't seen Lars in his several days. And he went over there and checked on him, found the cabin door unlocked. Nothing seemed to be unusual other than Lars wasn't there. And Ralph called the Sheriff Burl Warren and reported his friend missing. Sheriff Warren responded, searched the cabin, found $1,817 inside, stated nothing was suspicious. Lars was a retire, retired farmer, probably kept the money in his mattress. And there was three days of massive searching for Lars. Now when Ralph Crick was interviewed by the sheriff about his knowledge of Lars and the circumstances. This is what he said. He told the sheriff that Lars had complained to him just before he disappeared of being harassed by ghosts. Hmm. Well, the best that they could figure is Lars hadn't been seen by anybody for several days. And after four days of searching and not finding anything, it was canceled. So October 24th, everybody went home. Now there were still a lot of neighbors and friends that wouldn't give up looking for Lars because they said, something here's not right. We need to find our, our friend. But I want you to think of something. He said he was being harassed by ghosts. Okay, I understand. But what could that mean? Could ghosts also mean aliens in your bedroom? Could ghosts mean shadowy figures in the woods? Ghosts in 1945 might have meant something different to everybody. But why would he be harassed at 89 years old? I don't know. I thought about this a lot. And I got to tell you, it's the only case in the thousands I've ever read where somebody be, was complaining about ghosts. 
So he disappeared on October 19th. 11 days later, October 30th, one of the people that also lived in the mountains near Clayton, who just continued to search for Lars, was Mrs. Jessie Lynch. She was only one mile from Lars's cabin in an area that was previously searched in a ravine with a small creek. By a log, she found a body. It was Lars. She called the sheriff. He came out and he stated that they found Lars was only wearing a shirt and socks. Imagine finding that. They said that there were bodies over the almost the entire part of the body. He was in thick foliage. The coroner stated he died of exposure. Uh, I don't care who you are. If you don't find this suspicious, you need to leave this channel. So this happened on October 19th. The nights in Washington in this area get pretty cold at night. So dying from exposure would be understood. But Lars had lived in this area for decades. He knew the area well. Why would he be found a mile from the cabin, almost naked? Yeah, why? Where was the rest of his clothes? I've told you before that GHB plays a role in many of these deaths. Now, if Lars had been given a large dose of GHB in 1945, and he was laid in the woods to sleep under the GHB, he would have died from exposure and would have never woke up or would have woken up and couldn't have moved, which is part of the symptomology behind GHB. And that I discuss and explain in detail on Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence, in which a case in Spokane I talked about, not too far south of here, kind of explains it totally. Now people say, well, why would he have scratches all over his body? A couple things. If you're found in thick foliage and you're not wearing a lot of clothes, and let's just say I slowly drop you down through the trees and the brush, you're going to get a lot of scratches going down through it. Or how about if I carry you through the brush at a high speed? Good chances you're going to get scratches all over your body. There was never any talk, any talk at all that Lars was mentally unstable or that he had any type of dementia. None. So the idea that he voluntarily left the cabin, even under circumstances where he was deathly scared of ghosts and they were doing something to him in the cabin, at the minimum, you'd think you'd put your pants and your shoes on. Because leaving that cabin without your, your clothes is a death warrant in cold weather. It's a very unusual case. And it fits because he was missing clothes. No tracks. Found in an area that had been previously searched 10 times. Rest in peace, Lars. Next case, far northern California. Man's name is Max Paul. He was 71 years old. He went missing October 5th, 1950. He was a retired Stockton toolmaker. And this was 1950. He was wealthy for those days because he had sold his toolmaking company to a company called Ream. R-H-E-E-M Corporation. Well, one thing that Max loved to do was he loved to go hunting. And he got a hold of a friend named Mike Morgan. And he went up to his friends to stay with him and hunt the area of Horse Creek in Siskiyou County.
So this is Horse Mountain. This is the Oregon border. This is Horse Creek. This is a town called Hamburg. This area is very, very rural. Hardly anybody lives up there. Uh, I've been in this area many times. It's spooky to me. <laughs> it's spooky to me. There's a lot of people missing up in that area for a variety of causes. One thing I was always scared of when I was walking around out there was uh, drug labs and marijuana grows. In that part of California, half the time you gotta have your hand on your gun because you don't know what you're gonna walk into up there. So I'm sure it's changed by now, hopefully. But Max told his friend that he was gonna go hunting on White Mountain and he split up and his friend went to another location. He went to White Mountain and he didn't come back that night. So Mike called Siskiyou County Sheriff's, told him where his friend was gonna be and they all went out there and at the base of White Mountain they found Max's vehicle, exactly where he said it'd be. And the sheriff requested that search and rescue respond. And they also requested that the local lumber mill called Schwartz Mill close. And they send all of their workers out to help them search for this man. So in total, they had 75 rangers, law enforcement, hunters, locals, and one airplane flew the sky. Now I was thinking about this. For 1950, in this part of California, to get 75 people out looking for somebody, that's monumental. I'm not sure I've ever heard of that in that time frame, because it is so rural. Well, the day of the disappearance, it snowed four inches, and the sheriff stated that they covered every foot of ground on a two and a half mile radius and a half mile wide going up into the mountain on this gap. And then they came back down on the ridge lines, searching on their way coming down. It was a 10-day search effort. Freezing nights, they found nothing. Well, they offered a $500 reward about 10 days into the search to keep people into the field. And that did for another two weeks. So there were a lot of volunteers that just covered that area thick. Found nothing. So fast forward to September 1953 essentially three years later. Two hunters are in the White Mountains. They're coming down a ridge line and they see some bones and some clothing and some oddities. And they get down on their knees and they find a small wallet and in the wallet there's a hunting license issued to Max Paul. And there's a camera and there's some binoculars and they ended up finding the primary skeleton Siskiyou County Sheriff's came out and they declared that it was Max's body. Again, in an area that had been searched multiple, multiple times. No cause of death. But I want you to think about this. And, and trust me, many of you have made this point, but for some of you who may not have thought this, I'm going to say it. In 1950, they had no DNA testing. So let's pretend, let's just pretend for a second that I have some bones laying around and they're human. Say, I, I just happen to get them or I happen to buy them, which you can buy skeletons online. And I lay them out there and I make up a phony hunting license, throw some binoculars and a camera in there so that when the people find it, they'll think it's Max. But there's no proof that it is Max because they can't do DNA. That's right. Things have gotten a little more advanced now. You know, as little as 20 years ago, when DNA first started to come out, it was $32,000 to do a DNA test. Now it's a couple hundred dollars. So today it's a lot harder to fool somebody that a body is somebody else. 
But I think in years past, it could have been accomplished pretty easily. Which to me, I really wonder if there's some sophisticated entity out there that's taken people, who's saying that they couldn't make up a death, a body? Of course they could. Now, why put a body back in an area that had been searched multiple, multiple times? Well, if you've watched this movie, Carl Higdon was placed back exactly, you know, within 10 miles of where he disappeared. So why do that? Now, Carl, the person we highlighted in Missing 411, the UFO connection, was dropped after he was abducted. Dropped. Said he hurt his shoulder as he rolled down a hillside. Now, some people out there in this world think that alien entities or whoever is taking these people would never hurt us. I find that bizarre. <laughs> the way they returned Carl to Earth doesn't show a great respect for us. And there are thousands of people who have claimed abduction. And what they do to us doesn't seem very respectable. People have claimed it's very painful, forced insemination, forced intercourse. John Mack, a brilliant man, written a couple of books about this, a psychiatrist from Harvard. And I would encourage you to read his books if you truly doubt that this is occurring. He interviewed hundreds of people, hundreds, who claim this. And it was his expert opinion that there was something to it, the way these people discussed it. And when Carl disappeared, he was later interviewed by one of the top psychologists at the University of Wyoming. And it was also his opinion that Whatever, heart to, whatever happened to Carl, he believed it with 100% belief that it happened to him. And of course, he took polygraph tests and passed them. And there's all kinds of physical evidence with Carl's abduction that doesn't necessarily follow with other abductions. And in fact, with most other abductions, there's little or no physical evidence. But in Carl, strangely, there was, which is why it is in my movie. There's been a, there's been a lot of people who have written things about the movie that's 100% not true. 100% not true. I don't know why they do it, other than it's a misinformation campaign against me. But friends, before you judge a movie, watch the movie. Watch it. I go through, I probably went through thousands of hours of research before I wrote the storyline for that movie. I placed things in, took things out. We moved things around so it would flow. It would make sense and it would have factual evidence to back up what these people were claiming. Now this UFO here that was seen by the hunters, triangular UFO, it's very similar to what's called the TR-3B. And that supposedly is a test aircraft by the United States military. So is it possible, is it possible that our own people are taking these individuals in the woods? Maybe they dress up in costumes to look like alien entities. I have no idea. These are things that have been told to me by others. Now it is a fact that craft looks like the TR-3B. 
You can, you can look at a TR3B online. So why would our military be hovering above some hunters in the middle of nowhere? What kind of strange fanatical reason would the people in that craft, if they're us, be doing hovering over some hunters? To me, that's odd. That's really odd. I'd like to get into their minds, see how they'd like it if their relatives were just scared to death by some people on a craft. See how, how thoughtful they'd think that was. But if our military is involved in this, that's distasteful. But people have said, oh, Dave, don't you know what that craft looks like? Of course I do. I've known about it since we did this movie. And I never said aliens took anybody. A lot of people have said I did. I never said that. I said, whatever the entities are, whether they're us, whether they're extraterrestrial, ultra-terrestrial, terrestrial, who knows? Something took Carl Higdon. Something scared him pretty bad. And I think it was, he was very, very lucky to come back alive. So that's the missing cases for today. Kind of a little background. You can watch the movie right now uh, on Amazon, Vimeo, iTunes. If you want the, you want the uh, Blu-ray or DVD, buy it from me. And our website is NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. And then go to the online store. You can find all my books. Do not buy my books online. You will get ripped off. People are charging $75 to $150 for my books when you can get them on my site for $24.99. You can follow me on Twitter, David Politis at Can-Am Missing. Our missing persons website, Can-Am, like Canadian American, canammissing.com. Uh, and be nice to people. We need to have a society that supports each other. As we get into more troubled versions of our world, we need to have small groups, neighborhoods, cities that are a tight bond and you need to look out for each other remember the old days the old neighborhood watch days we need to get those back going again but just at the neighborhood level even everybody if you're living in an apartment complex everybody on your floor get together down in the lobby once a month and just say hey are we ready if uh if a natural disaster hit can we support each other does everybody have enough water to last two weeks? Does everybody have enough food to last two weeks? If you don't, you should. You should have several cases of water stored up. You should have a water filtration system. You can buy them online, buy them at REI and at Amazon. So that if you have to go down to the river, or you have to go down to the lake, you can get some water, you'll live. Just the basic necessities. Also tell people, get a little burner. You can buy them at, uh, REI. You can buy them online. All the sports stores. It's a little gas, a little burner on top, and you can cook your food right there. And uh, a lot of these freeze-dried meals are pretty darn good. I mean, when I go camping, I'm kind of picky. I'll pick out the ones I like, but I like them. They're, they're really good. So, uh, you'd be surprised. Be ready. Be ready. In the meantime, thank you for being here. I'm humbled that anybody watches. It helps me if you watch the video all the way through to the end. Even if you have to get up, let it keep playing in the background, listen. If you watch it multiple times, it helps us even more. So, I have 400 plus videos. Look at the can Missing Project logo on the bottom left-hand screen of the screen. If you click on that, that'll take you to another screen that shows videos it'll be a sign that says videos right across the middle you click on that and that'll take you to all of my videos and then under the pinned comment right here 
also a list of my videos, the most popular ones if you want to watch. So thank you. Be nice to your neighbor. Politus out. <laughs>